please can you remind me if you'll if you'll be so kind staring out into space asking god to hear my case trying to think of all things past how long will my memory last the purple angel Well, hi, and welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm Lori LeBay, your host and founder of Alzheimer Speaks. Um, for those of you that are new to our show, I just want to give you a little background about who we are and why we're here. Alzheimer Speaks is an advocacy-based company providing multiple platforms to shift our dementia care culture from crisis to comfort around the world. And we believe by joining forces and sharing knowledge and having everyday conversations about life with dementia that we can remove the stigmas attached to memory loss and help those living with the disease continue to live with purpose. Together, I feel really strongly that we can help others understand the true needs of this disease and remove those myths and stigma that just create so much fear and isolation for not only those diagnosed, but family and friends and the community at large. At our core, we believe collaboration is really the only way we're going to win this battle. And I know it's working because of all of your likes and clicks and shares. You see, each of you plays such an important role in helping us spread the word, getting the knowledge, getting information and resources out to the public. Um, every time you like us and share with your Facebook friends, your LinkedIn colleagues, your Twitter tribes, whatever social media you're part of, you're pushing valuable information out and people will grab it when they need it. So often, many times, um, people in our own circle of friends are dealing with this, yet they don't talk about it. So please know that your social media, your presence really does make a difference. I also want to um, let everybody who's listening know that we're always looking for new guests, and we interview everybody um, from those diagnosed to families uh, to professionals, to writers and directors and um, advocates of this disease. Everybody's voice needs to be heard because we all are in this together. So I would, um, I would encourage you to reach out to me <clears throat> and, um, and just shoot me an email. You can go to alzheimerspeaks.com, click on the big gold button at the top that says contact us, and shoot me an email. Know that all of our shows are also... Um, in the archives, so you can go back and listen to them any time that you would like. Now, before I introduce our guests today, I do want to just give a shout out to some core organizations that I think are really important for people to know about. Um, the first is Alzheimer's Disease International. They are the organization of all Alzheimer's associations around the world. There, you can not only just find who's closest to you as far as a chapter, but you're going to find global knowledge as well. So make sure you go to Alzheimer's Disease International and check them out. Um, there are also a few other organizations that many, are, I find, aren't familiar with, and that's when they're dealing with other types of dementia. It might be Lewy body or frontal temporal lobe. Or maybe they're having some issues with speech. Um, for speech, you would want to go to the National Aphasia Association um, and then again hit the Lewy Body Dementia Association or the Association for Frontal Temporal Degeneration. And for those of you looking for a more holistic approach, check out Alzheimer's um, Research and Prevention Foundation. There you'll find out about diet and exercise um, and meditation. Um, if you're looking to get involved in a clinical trial, go to Facebook and uh, check out the Alzheimer's team. They have uh, a few trials up and running. You can take a short survey and uh, see if by chance that would fit for you. Um, here on, I don't know if, if all of you know this, but we've changed our platforms here at Alzheimer's Speaks. And so I want to give a shout out to a few of my buddies here at Alive and Social. Um, the first one is Apples to Apples, and Apples to Apples is a sports show featuring a father and son team 
um, Scott and Drew, uh, Applebaum. So find out if fathers really know best. They have a lively conversation, and um, I think that they would just love to uh, hear from you, and you will be able to hear from them some fun bantering back and forth. Um, another show that I want to give a holler out to is called Pardon the Descent, and this is a talk show hosted by comedian Joey Vincent. And Joey uses humor and sarcasm and satire to analyze um, politics and current events and social issues of the day. He admittedly is um, progressively learning, but he identifies um, himself as uh, political, nonpartisan, but very much pro-human. He is passionate about exposing corruption injustice and disruptive um, illusions. Um, so check out Pardon the Descent with, uh, with Joey Vincent. I think you will have a, have a riot just listening to him. The third one I want to point out on Alive and Social is the Twin Cities hit show. And I'm really excited because actually tomorrow I get to be part of that show with Rusty Gatenby, uh, who is the former KSTP traffic and entertainment reporter and comedian Miss Shannon and the former Bloomington cop uh, turned comedian Chuck Gallup. Um, looking forward to having a great discussion with them at 9.30 a.m., uh, they always are fun to be with, and uh, we're going to be talking about the new dementia film out that is just launching um, this, in fact, this week called His Neighbor Phil. And we're going to be launching that actually at the Minnesota State Fair. So if you're out there, um, Alzheimer's Speaks will be at the State Fair on Thursday, the 27th. And from 12 to 2, we'd love to hear your opinions about dementia in caregiving. You can come out to the Health Star Home Health booth, which is in the CARE 11 building. And that's in the intersection near Dan Patch and Cooper. We're also going to be having actors coming in from the film. And on the 30th, between 10 and noon, they'll be a signing. But you can stop by the Health Star booth anytime, August 27th through September 7th from 9 to 9, and there you'll get great resources. They're also doing memory screening, so and it would be a fun time. I've been out there last year with them, and it was absolutely a phenomenal booth to be at, people sharing tons of stories and, and doing memory screening. So that's it for my house cleaning, so let's get to why we're together today. Um, really excited to have two authors with us who have written a fantastic book, one that um, is really a support group in a book. What a cool concept is that? It's called Dementia Caregivers Share Their Stories. And so I'm going to introduce each of them, and then from there we'll go ahead into our line of questions, and um, I think you'll learn a lot. I think it'll be really an interesting conversation to listen to. Linda... Um, Mark Cute is a licensed uh, clinical social worker in Wisconsin and has counseled people with mental health diagnosis and or dementia and provided services to their families for over 35 years. She's a trained facilitator and facilitates AD and dementia support groups. And AD, for those of you are, that are new, is Alzheimer's disease. And her clinical educational experience is coupled with 28 years, yeah, 28 years of personal and practical experience gained while providing care to her mother, her father, and her mother-in-law, all who had types of dementia. She is the co-author of the book we're going to discuss today, Dementia Caregivers Share Their Stories, a support group in a book, which was published by Vanderbilt University Press. She is currently serving as the Education and Family Support Coordinator at the Alzheimer's Association of, the, of Southeast Wisconsin, and she continues training and her work exclusively with persons with dementia, along with their care partners in early stages of dementia. She's frequently requested at conferences as a speaker and provides consultation and training outside of her job at the association. So welcome, Linda. How are you today? I am great. Well, Thank wonderful. you very much for introducing me. Well, very excited to have you here today. I think your book is a great concept and has lots of wonderful information. 
Let me go ahead and uh, introduce your co-author. Antoine um, Crane is a facilitator for two dementia caregiver support groups at the Family Alliance Senior Center in Woodstock, Illinois, and uh, where he volunteers. He cared for his wife, Martha, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's at the age of 53. He served um, on the board of directors for the Family Alliance for over 10 years. And uh, like I said, he is the co-author of this fabulous book. I'm going to just um, read a couple of quotes um, that I want to make sure that I don't forget to get in. So bear with me. But I, I think that they are just really rave reviews of, of what this book is about. The first one is by Daniel um, Kuhn who is a master social worker and the director of, the, of education at Mathers Lifeways Institute on Aging, which is just a fabulous organization. And his comments are this, by drawing upon the words of caregivers who have walked the journey of dementia, the authors cast much needed light upon this long and winding road. Through the experience of caring for loved ones, these unsung heroes have made the past less difficult for others who follow in their footsteps. And I, you know, as a daughter whose mom had this disease for 30 years, I so, I so believe that those of us on this path can make it much easier for the next guy. Um, another one is by Jim May, and he is saying that the authors have brought to light the stories of family members and friends who have cared for their loved ones suffering from dementia. These stories teach what is possible and remind us we're not alone, a wonderful and vital contribution to the aging society. And again, that isolation and feeling so so alone is, is very overwhelming for most families on this path. And, um, and the lack of knowledge in terms of what is possible with life of dementia really needs to be brought to light. So I think this is an extremely important book. Um, so let's go ahead and start. Um, I'm just going to ask each of the authors first um, if they can give us a little more background. I gave you a little teeny um, glimpse that they've both dealt personally with this, but we'd just like to hear in their own words. And Linda, I'm going to let you go first. Can you tell us a, a little bit more detail about your how you've personally been touched by this disease? Uh, yes. I think the, um, obviously my father was the first one who um, had dementia, and my father died 20 years ago, so my father, um, we didn't have the evaluation centers we have now, and so in looking back and looking at all the symptoms, we feel that he probably um, had some type of either normal pressure hydrocephaly, and there was some vascular dementia. Um, then my mother um, and so my father died, my mother was living independently and started to have some changes and um, she had a vascular dementia and it was um, very challenging to see her change. Um, this was a woman who used to, you know, plant and harvest a three-quarter acre garden and uh, now she was uh, struggling to handle a raised bed garden and so it was with um, her guidance, because that's one of the things that I really feel, the people uh, with dementia are our teachers. And so I was in the field, I was able to understand a lot of things, but it's also so different when it's your parent who is being challenged. And um, that's how my journey started. And then <clears throat> later on in my mother's um, journey, my husband's mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And so it was a long stretch, and uh, we learned a lot of things. And I was able to help and support others um, as a social worker, but more important, as a family caregiver. And uh, that allowed me to connect with people and try to understand how their journey um, was uh, impacting them and try to give them the support that they needed. Um, and that's one of the reasons that Anatole and I started talking about and um, 
thinking about the potential of the book because caregivers have so much to say. And speaking of that, I think I'll let the uh, my co-author and friend Anatole share a little bit about his background. Wonderful. Anatole, you want to give us a little background about how you were touched with your wife's journey? Sure, Laurie. Thank you. Um, Martha was teaching uh, in the Eldon Public School System. She taught children with learning disabilities. And what I first noticed was that at the end of the school year, when she would be uh, uh, testing these children to, to uh, you know, evaluate their progress in her program, she would have to uh, translate raw scores on these tests into a scaled score, which would give them a more a meaningful number. And she would normally come home from work and, and, and just sit down and do these things. Um, but I noticed this one year she was having a great deal of difficulty in doing this particular task, which she had done for, for quite a few years. So I would help her. I'd sit down and uh, help her uh, read across the line, to pick, up, pick up the scaled score number that she needed. Uh, but it was very frustrating for her. Uh, when I would come home from work, I would find piles of paper on the floor where she had tried to do this. Uh, and had great difficulty. And as I say, she'd done it for many years. Then um, that was in the spring. Over the summer, things seemed to get better. But uh, I know now that that was because there was less stress on her and, and she didn't have this sort of task to do. Come the fall, when she started the new school year, uh, the this year had uh, had not just barely started, when she was called in for a conference with her principal and with various officials of the school, uh, union representative, and and uh, I decided I'd better go with her. And at that point, uh, they told us that uh, she was having a lot of trouble doing many things that she had done for years. She was uh, not getting along with the secretaries, being very argumentative, and she always worked very well with those people. It was always a close relationship. And they wanted her to take a leave until uh, she could get things straightened out. Uh, but by the time they did this, I had already made a, an appointment for her at Mayo Clinic for an evaluation because I, I was realizing as soon as the school year started that she was having problems again. So we went to Mayo, and uh, after a few days there, um, uh, which were rather humiliating for her. I, I think because they asked her, some of the questions that they asked her were probably similar to some of the things she asked her, her LD kids, uh, and she was embarrassed by it all. But the upshot of, of it all was that they said it was probable Alzheimer's disease. Martha understood the diagnosis, uh, but she rejected it. She said, I don't have that. They're wrong. So uh, at the time, of course, there weren't the PET scans and the other tools that were available today. And I said, well, they say probable. means they don't know for sure. Let's us assume that they're wrong, and we'll go ahead and fight this thing and, and get you back in teaching. Well, obviously, that never happened. The, the, the disease progressed. Uh, we eventually went to Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's in Chicago to confirm the diagnosis, which they did. And uh, things just sort of progressed from there. Okay, wonderful. Well, thanks for that little bit of history. It just it, it's helpful for not only myself but our audience listening. Um, and so I appreciate you um, both being so authentic and in, in sharing that. Um, Antol, can you tell us uh, how the heck did you and Linda meet? Huh. Well, when, when Martha became ill, um, I recall getting a, a phone call from a cousin of mine who had had a liver transplant and, and was going to various support groups. And she said to me, I know you won't pay any attention to this, but you should look for a support group to join. Uh, so I did. I called, uh, I found one in Palatine, Illinois, which is close to where I live in Barrington. Uh, and it sounded pretty good. It sounded like uh, it would be worthwhile. Then I called Family Alliance, and I spoke to Linda. And by the end of our conversation, I, I said to myself, well, this is where I want to go. 
this person speaks with such knowledge and such empathy and obvious from her questions, she knows what she's talking about and cares. Uh, so I started going to support groups. Uh, there was Linda, who was at the time, <clears throat> pardon me, who was at the time the clinical director at Family Alliance, uh, support groups that she was running. Okay. And through that, we became friends. Uh, we began to go, we went to conferences together, and uh, we wrote the book, and we're still great friends. Okay, great. Linda, can you tell us um, why you two decided to take this project up, and is there a, is there a story behind that? How did you even start the conversation to write a book? Well, one of the things that happened is as Anatole and I got to know each other, and as we saw um, the challenges that caregivers faced, but also the successes they had, we realized there was nothing out there that really reinforced everything that the caregivers do right. Uh, it's so hard when you're responding to the needs of an individual who's changing in spite of your best efforts to gain any sense of um, feeling good about what it is you're doing because they keep on changing and you have to keep on learning. And so we said there's got to be a way for caregivers to be reinforced for everything that they're doing and how they're responding to challenges. And they, they need to get their story out. Everybody has a story. That story needs to be validated. And, and that's um, through the support groups. We could, see the, we could see that happening. People would share their story and others would shake their heads. And for one of the first times, people were able to be um, accepted and others understood. And that has so much power that that um, energy that was in that support group that we wanted to have something out there that would be available to other people that may not have a support group near them or may not have been told, the told was told, to kind of check those support, group, support groups out. So that's kind of how we got the idea and started through the book and started through the stories. And if it wouldn't be for Anatole, I probably would still be collecting stories because I enjoyed that part because people felt so good for one time to have someone sit down and give them two, three hours, maybe an evening, two evenings, to share everything that they did and how much they had accomplished because they never get to do that because they're so busy doing things. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Anatole, um, you know, she had mentioned it's really about sharing stories. Is there, is there another central theme that kind of runs through the book that, that you felt you had when you, when you uh, decided to, to get together and write this? Yeah, yeah, there are basically, I think, two themes in here which are maybe slightly contradictory. Uh, the first one is that you as a caregiver, a dementia caregiver, have within you capabilities and powers that you never knew you had. You can do things that I'm sure in many cases you never wanted to do in terms of caring for somebody, but you can do things that you once thought, I can never do this. You, you have great capabilities. And the other, which I said is only slightly contradictory, is that even though you have this abilities, even though you have this kind of strength, you don't need to do this by yourself. Every one of us in this caregiving situation needs help. There's family, friends, uh, uh, paid caregivers, support groups. We, we emphasize support groups throughout the book and, and, and everything we do. Uh, and if necessary, uh, um, in-home care and possibly nursing home placement if one should decide that that's the appropriate thing for them to do. So these are the things we emphasize throughout. This is, these are the things we believe very strongly. Okay, great. And you've got, you know, your chapters are really clearly written, like early symptoms and diagnosis and 
who gives care and how do we do it and uh, the emotions of caregiving, which, you know, people really don't talk a lot about that and holidays and other celebrations, mm -hmm. caregiver stress, um, meaningful connections, and, and the list goes on. Um, through through the chapters here. Linda, can you tell us, uh, you know, how would you recommend families decide as to who's going to be the primary caregiver? Well, many times um, they really, the decision is made due to perhaps the proximity. One person in the family may live closer. Um, sometimes the siblings <clears throat> may decide that, you know, at present, one of, the, one of their family members is not working and maybe that, that person will take up the role. Sometimes families themselves, <clears throat> one person in particular has had a close relationship. In my situation, it was myself. And we both shared the care. I think what's really hard is that each family is so different and each caregiving situation is so different that many um, factors enter in when it's decided who's going to be the main caregiver. After going to and working in the field for so long, what I noticed is that some people can't handle illness. I had a brother who just really had a hard time with any kind of illness and it kind of felt like if it could happen to mom, it could happen to me. And so he kept his distance. Um, in my husband's family, and I've seen this in many families, if you still need to do, uh, some people live in the county of and, and they just cannot handle what is happening. Um, and the caregivers that are able to be successful are the ones that are able to get, as Anato was talking, the support, the education, get the background knowledge, and then learn they can't do it alone. Um, what is hard for mom and dad. The hard part is, is that we plan for lots of things and we look forward to lots of things. Most of us never plan for caregiving. And so that's what really makes it hard because all of a sudden it is upon us. And we may not like it that we have that role, um, but most times, and for many people, it is something they felt one of the gentlemen in the book, Jesse, said, you know what, um, I, w I was there to do it for her. Are they happy when other family members don't come up to the plate? Of course not. And we used to have a saying in the support groups, there's either, either one member that is figuratively or literally in California. They just don't get what is going on for various reasons. And then there's a totally different picture when it's the spouse who is the caregiver. Because that's your partner. And I know that that's one thing that Anatole and I did in the process of writing the book, we started a transition group for spouses. And I asked him to be the co-facilitator because obviously I don't have experience as a spouse, um, and as a spouse who has someone with dementia that I'm, I'm responding to. And maybe, Anatole, do you want to bring out any of the, um, the challenges that a spouse faces while they're um, trying to respond to the care? Well, yeah, it, it, with a case of a, a spouse with dementia, the decision of who is to be the primary caregiver is a whole lot easier. If it's your wife or your husband and he or she becomes ill, you just say, well, you've got something here, well, we're going to work with it, and I will take care of you. It falls to you to be the primary caregiver. There's nobody else. Um, if you're lucky, uh, as I am, you have a family who's very supportive, uh, and you have some friends, and you have people like Linda to help you along the way. But you as a spouse just, and many people, many people we've interviewed have said the same thing. Uh, when it happened, there wasn't any question. I was the one to do it. And, yeah. And that's it. My, my dad was like that, too. He just so surprised the whole family how he just stood up and just took it on, didn't bat an eye. 
And I remember having a conversation with him on how are you doing with this? Because this was a guy who didn't cook, didn't clean. You know, mom took care of the indoors and the kids, and he was the outdoor guy and kind of the sports guy. And um, he, you know, he couldn't even boil water before all of this. Mm -hmm. Um, Mom did the financing, all that stuff, and he was just incredible. And, you know, his his response was, you know, she took care of us all these years. This is the least I can do is to be here, you know, for that time. And so um, it was it was really a wonderful example to see him set not only for our family, but for friends um, in terms of of his courage and his grace. You know, it reminds me a great deal of my own father, who uh, he was not sports minded, but mom did the cooking and the usual housework and things uh, and then she had a stroke and my dad had had a couple of heart attacks when she had her stroke and when you were with him it would be oh i'm not going to make it i'm not going to see the grandkids graduate high school i'm not going to see anyone married she had her stroke and he just took over completely he learned to cook he learned to clean the house he took care of my mother of course, she never gave him credit. She never said his chicken soup was anywhere near as good as hers. But he made it, and he had never made a pot before in his life. <laughs> well, you can't, you can't get it all, you know? <laughs> right. Well, and you know, when you bring that up, I mean, uh, my mother was the most incredible role model. My mother was a social worker without a license. If somebody needed help, if someone needed support, she was always there. And so that's, that was my training. Um, in getting into responding to the needs of my family members. Okay. Um, Linda, can you share with us, um, you know, given your, your background and stuff, what is it that, um, that impacts caregivers the most as far as family and friends? How can, how can family and friends really support them or not support them? Well, I think it's really hard, and what I see happen most is I see that um, when that individual with the diagnosis is less able to participate in conversations and less able to interact quickly, I mean, we expect people to respond so quickly, um, they find that um, the, the friends that they've had, when they go out as, a, as maybe couples or foursome, um, they'll all end up talking to everyone but the person with dementia because they don't realize that as the illness progresses, that person needs a little more time to respond, a little more understanding, and um, they need people to continue to acknowledge who they are. And I think we have social friends many times and we don't realize that those social friends are there to do fun things. And then when you're dealing with some type of dementia, um, that's kind of scary, and people pull back because it's scary. And when people don't have the education and support, they don't know how to respond. They don't know how to include that person, and that causes challenges because you think you have a good support network, and all of a sudden um, you find that people maybe don't want to do as much or they 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 make excuses as to why they don't want to get together. And that person with dementia struggles also because as the illness progresses, they're less capable of saying to their friend Jane, for example, well, how are your children and how are they doing in college? Because I'm not remembering how many children you have. I'm not remembering that they're going to college right now. So it looks like they are not as friendly as they used to be, and it's the illness that's causing that. So many friends back away because they really don't know what to do. Many persons who are caring um, have a real hard time with knowing what to ask for. Um, When someone says, well, let me know if you need help. Well, you know, they do need help. But they need help because they're just doing too many things through the day and they're doing so many things they can't think of ways they need help. And we would do that in support groups. And we continue to do that now by allowing care uh, partners and caregivers to write down some of the things. You know, could you could you go get these things from the grocery store for me? Could you get some medicines for me? Because if you have specific things you can give someone to do, 
it's a lot easier for them to do it. Or can you take my my husband, my mother, out for coffee? You know, those are the kind of things that we need to think about. But most times, after that diagnosis is given to that individual, the family is very impacted by the diagnosis, and they're really living with that negative framework. They're just like watching and waiting for the deterioration as opposed to um, continuing on with living. And and that's one of the things that I think makes a big difference. When they lose sight of their friends or the friends aren't able to give them what they need, the big difference is for them to be able to connect with others who get it, who understand the illness. And the strength of those friendships continues on. Um, an example of that would be that group that I spoke about that Antoine and I started for the spouses. It was a spousal group, and it was for people who were experiencing transitions. And we started that oh, at least 15 years ago, I think. Um, I'm not sure exactly on the dates. But the people that were in that group still remain friends. And the group happened at 3.30 in the afternoon. And after the group, they would all go out to dinner. So they started to connect with each other, develop new friendship relationships, and they were able to sustain, and that's what was able to sustain them throughout the course of this illness. And they have gone through that and gone through going to each other's weddings as well as funerals, and they remain connected and strong, and they continue to support others. So it's those relationships, when the certain relationships in your friend your friend group and your family group fall away, what can happen if people get support is they can develop new relationships with people that thoroughly understand the challenges and the heartfelt changes that they're all going through, and they can be there to support each other and talk to each other and call each other. Wonderful. Can, can I add just one thing to that? Sure. Of that group that Linda was talking about, three of us now conduct support groups for other caregivers. Uh, one was was working in in schools most of her working career. Uh, another was a physician, an OBGYN, and I was a microbiologist. None of us trained social workers or in that field at all. And as a result of, of uh, the group that Linda started and making a couple of us her assistant caregivers, uh, when she left Family Alliance, two of us stayed on to run support groups. And the third uh, runs another support group in Wisconsin. So we have only Linda to blame for getting us involved in that way. <laughs> Well, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I do the memory cafes and uh, people always ask, you know, do we need a, a nurse? Do we need a doctor? Do we need a licensed social worker? And, I, and my answer is always the same. No, you need someone who is compassionate and who, you know, cares about people who is able to say they don't have the answer all the time because it's not about fixing people and who can um, be socially respectful to everyone. Um, right. and, and if they have background in it, that's a, you know, a caveat um, in terms of, of really being able to um, read what people are going through and read what they need. Um, but, you know, it's not about having all the answers. Sometimes it's just allowing people to have a voice and a, no. and a and safe it, place. Oh, go ahead. And it, it's, it's wonderful to conduct a group and see how much the members of the group give to one another. Mm -hmm. uh, you have only to get the ball rolling, keep the conversation going, and sometimes I can just sit back and let them help one another, saying very little myself. So you're, you're absolutely right. I appreciate those comments. Yeah. We've had in our, we've got three memory cafes, and we've had a, a few um, people pass, and the care partners have really stepped up, stayed with the group, 
and said, you know, we want to help as much as we can, you know, just let us know how. And so they've been helping with facilitation. They've been doing, getting out and doing more advocating and speaking and being on panels and all kinds of different roles. It's really kind of been fun to see them grow and, and help so many others that, you know, aren't as far along on the path. Yeah. Well, you know, and that goes along with uh, what that initial group did, that transition group. <clears throat> we uh, presented at the American Society on Aging um, on the kinds of things that can go on and the positive growth that can occur when you get that support, when you get that help, when you focus on life as well as responding as best as you can to the challenges of any type of dementia. And we see that now in the southeastern Wisconsin regional area. We started out last year with three memory cafes. Now we have 16. And the importance of that is, again, it's an activity, it's an opportunity, an outlet for socialization and sitting down and everyone accepting you at your new normal. You know, as care partners, we change uh, as a person with dementia. They are changing and they're working really hard, but the friendships that they've developed at the member cafes, at different outings and, and social gatherings that we have, it has been able to help them to try different things and be enrolled in brain health programs, be enrolled in um, uh, adult day programs, knowing that they need to get out there and stay connected. It helps to maintain skills for as long as possible. So, Laura, you are so right in seeing the goodness and and what can be done, the power of the relationships that are developed when you're attempting to gain support and you're meeting with other people that share some of the same challenges. Yeah, it's... Uh... Well, what I see is it's that fire, that passion that's ignited and the wands kind of pass from one to another in terms of, of getting that flame going and how they spread. And it's, it's really a beautiful thing to be able to watch and, and to be part of. So kudos to you guys um, for all you're doing. Um, Anatole, can you tell us what do caregivers find to be the most difficult aspect of, of giving care? Well, it's... It... It's my experience and my own and from the people I've talked to is, is that um, it's the loss of the relationship uh, that you've come, become accustomed to and cherished. Uh, the person that you've lived with for however many years uh, is slipping away before you. Uh, things you used to do together uh, you can't do anymore. So the, the loss of whether it's a parent or a spouse uh, of the person that you've become accustomed to is, is terribly hurtful. Uh, you, um, yeah, Linda? Yeah, I was thinking about uh, Kathy, um, Kathy Kathy was mentioned in the book. And you know, I mean, the good thing is, is that she and her husband Bob use a lot of humor and humor really makes a difference. But, you know, it's the kind of loss they were able to laugh about, but it's a heavy-duty loss. They were sitting together. It was their 25th anniversary. Um, they raised a glass of champagne um, at their anniversary celebration, and uh, Kathy's husband, Bob, said to her, well, tell me, did we have a good time? And she said, yes, we did. And they clinked their glasses, and they laughed. But those are the kind of things that are vital to be able to do, to celebrate, to laugh, but in order to do that, you have to also cry to get to work through those losses. And Laura, you just said it before. You can't fix this. What you do is you work through it. It's grief work. And the more we can work through that grief, the better off we are. It was Jack Cornfield who said the things that matter most is how well did we live, how fully did we love, and how deeply did we learn to let go? And that's one thing that you're doing within dementia caregiving is you're letting go of that person as they used to be and you're connecting with them as they are now with this new normal. And the people that have the hardest time are the people that 
have a hard time working through that loss and letting go. We have to let go of who that person was and accept them as they are. And when that happens, then we can still have, like you mentioned the chapter in the book, those meaningful connections because we can still stay connected to that person and that can help sustain us as sharing and talking can. But going along with what Anatole said, it's the loss, but it's an ambiguous loss because the person is right there in front of you, but they're not there because they're not the same person. And the outside world doesn't have any way of recognizing or acknowledging that loss. And many times people will say to individuals who are dementia caregivers, well, you're so lucky, your mom or dad or your husband or wife is still here. And that can be so hurtful because, well, yeah, they're here, but they're not the same person. And so society has a hard time understanding that. And the more that we can um, do a lot of things, such as you're doing, Lori, and such as we're trying to do, to allow people to be accepted um, as who they are no matter what, and, and learn and better understand the different types of dementia so we can realize that that person is suffering from brain failure. They have a broken brain. We have kidney failure, we have heart failure, we have brain failure. And that they are doing as much as they can with the parts of their brain that are still working, and they need to be honored. Um, and the person who is caring for them needs to be honored because they have taken up that charge and they're having to work and to change and to get that support because now their partner can no longer support them in ways that they used to. Yeah, I, I totally, totally agree. There is a book, um, I'm trying to think of the author's name. I want to say it's Pauline something, and she works, I believe, at the University of Minnesota called, I think, Ambiguous Loss. And, oh, yes, I have that book. Yeah, yes. and she initially wrote that uh, because of 9-11, but it so applies to dementia and all the, the multiple levels of loss. And I know on my journey with my mama, you know, you just... It's, you know, you can look at multiple levels of, of loss, but I also looked at it as multiple levels of unconditional love that I didn't know existed because it just kept testing me, you know, for another, exactly. to rise to exactly. another level every time there was a, a loss. And so um, for me, it was, you know, I tried to kind of twist it and, and put it in a really positive light and um, a way for me to grow as an individual and um, and take that um, take that experience and, and spin it in a way that I felt was healthy for me anyways. And, and I think it was healthy well, for mom too. Oh, exactly. And that person, once you're able to do that, I mean, my mother became a, a philosopher in her later years um, because she would slow down and take time. My mother never took time. My mother was a hard worker. That's all she did was work. That's all she knew was work. And through her dementia, she slowed down. And I would always take note of these things, the different things that she said. And, you know, throughout our whole life, um, you know, we, we live by the motto, hard work never killed anybody. And it was, you know, she came in in the middle of the afternoon and you sat down. She would say, what's the matter? Are you sick? And she just was so full of everything that needed to be done. And in her later years, I was a long-distance caregiver, and when she came to my house, she was watching me work in the garden. She watched me, you know, clean the flower beds. And, and then she started to talk, and she said, you know, hard work never killed anybody. And I said, yeah, yeah, Mom, I know, I know. And then she said, but not taking a break that's going to get you down. <laughs> you know, if I might just, uh, along with loss, um, there's even even sometimes extremely late in the illness when you think uh, that the individual is no longer understanding uh, anything, there can come flashes of understanding which just are startling. Uh, I think of one episode, I think I have it, I think it's in the book, when Martha was in the nursing home, my granddaughter, Anna, and I were out one spring day walking with her down the street. She was in her jerry chair, and we were pushing her down the street. She was completely uncommunicative at the time. My granddaughter, Anna, and I were talking, and Martha would stare straight ahead, not responsive to anything that was said, uh, whether we addressed it directly to her or not. 
And at one point, we were just joking about something, Anna and mm-hmm. I, and I said, how would it be if I did something or other? And she said, oh, Grandpa, that would be even worse <laughs> At which point, my wife turned her head, looked at us incredulous, and said, worse and then turned right back and looked straight ahead again. <clears throat> and whatever it is, it, it got through to her. She's a school teacher. But that's not a word. I know it isn't a word. She, and she was able to respond to it to the point where my granddaughter went home and told her mother, Mom, Grandma's getting better, which, of course, she wasn't. Mm-hmm. So that no matter where they are, I, it brings up a point that, you know, I'd like to make to some physicians I've known that no matter how far along they are in the illness, they may understand what you're saying. So be careful what you say in front of them. I think they should always um, be conscious of that. I, I'm a firm believer that they can take it all in. They just can't spit it all out in, in the fashion that they used to. And if we would slow down enough to pay attention to the nonverbals, we would see that. You know, it's it's um, been pounded into people's heads that people in a coma can understand everything that's going on around them. And it's yeah, like we need to apply that to dementia uh, because there's a well, lot of very disrespectful things uh, that happen, especially in later stages. Um, but even in earlier stages, when people go to a meeting and they're left out of the conversation and the conversation's about them, and um, exactly. Exactly. people talk around you them. Know, mm-hmm. go one ahead, thing that happened this spring that was absolutely phenomenal, we have had uh, these five couples in our early stage group and they have done presentations at the Alzheimer's Association Conference in um, northern Wisconsin um, and talked about themselves, how they feel, how they felt about the diagnosis, how they felt about the physician's response to them. And they were given the opportunity to do grand rounds at Aurora St. Luke's in Milwaukee. And so they were available, and one gentleman um, whose name is Mike, said, when you're talking to that person with dementia, you think you're talking 20 miles an hour. To us, it's like 50 miles an hour. Please talk to us, but just remember to slow down. And when I think of all the struggles that individuals have had in having people talk with them, most people think, well, in the medical community, they would understand. But most times, they don't take the time to do that, and things are changing now so that they are taking that time to the work that, that you do, Lori, through what we've done, through what Anatole is doing, and that advocacy is so important so that we get everybody on the same page and working with that individual as long as they can, and when they can no longer express themselves as they would like to, to be so respectful of them just as you mentioned, Anatole, and you did too, Lori, when you talked about how we need to be very careful of what we say. You never talk about that about that person in front of them because they can hear things all the way through the entirety of the illness. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Yeah. Um, Linda, can you talk a little bit about how can caregivers go about caring for themselves? That's something that um, isn't talked about enough, and, and when it is, I think it's still kind of danced around. Um, can you give us some specifics? Yeah, um, one of the things that we that I, I do a lot, and I've seen the importance of, I can really, I can almost tell the difference in the caregiver when, when caregivers start taking life too seriously. Um, and and there's, a, there's a saying, you know, don't take yourself so seriously, or you might become seriously ill. And it is so true. And I think of myself and caring for my mother, and I knew I was in trouble when I lost my sense of humor. My mother was still telling jokes. She was telling them slow, but I was always medicalizing them. So I just didn't get her humor anymore. And that's when I knew I was in trouble. And the one thing that can happen, and then one of the reasons we wrote the book too, is for caregivers to give each other permission to get help, to get support so that they can understand when you get a diagnosis of any type of dementia, it's not just a diagnosis of that person. It's a diagnosis that impacts the entire family. And if you want to be the one who's going to be there and looking toward and planning for how that care is going to be provided, then you have to take care of yourself. 
So in support groups, we have speakers come in. They talk about Tai Chi. They talk about stress. Um, we promote caregivers talking to each other. Um, they see it when certain caregivers end up having medical issues uh, that result from the caregiving. And spouses have the greatest challenges with this because of that back and forth relationship. They don't realize how much they're doing at times. But it's permission, whether it's you, Lori, whether it's Anatol doing support groups, whether it's myself, to say to them, take care of yourself. Take a break. I just had an email from one of the caregivers in the early stage group who said, thank you for promoting that I get a day out in golf. It felt really good to do something, quote, unquote, normal. Because yeah. they're spending so much time on that person they're not realizing the impact of that illness. And and again, if I do anything, I try to give permission for people to get help and support. Well, and I think one of the reasons it's so important, too, is because after you lose someone, and that might be maybe they move into a community and they no longer live with you, or it might be they pass. I mean, there can be all kinds of different transitions. But um, one of the things that I find people struggle with is, who am I? Who am I anymore? I've got all this time on my hands. And I know I went through that with uh, the loss of my dad. I was prepared for it when I, when I finally did lose my mom, um, much more so. But, you know, if you can keep yourself engaged and if you can, you know, um, be healthy yourself, make sure that you're getting refueled. And I think a lot of times one of the pitfalls with being a care partner is we just get so used to routine and doing what we're doing. We don't even know that we're not full anymore as a person, mm -hmm. um, energy wise. And, um, you know, I've shared this story like a, a zillion times um, with audiences before and here on the air, but I had girlfriends that didn't give up on me and kept saying, come on, meet us for coffee, meet us for coffee. And I kept saying, no, I was too busy, too busy, too busy. And one day I had a really bad day and I said, <laughs> I said, okay, I'll give you 10 minutes. Like I was the queen of England coming to visit, you know, and, and they were, you know, they should be so blessed that they would have my presence for 10 minutes. And, you know, I, I ended up staying for two hours and we laughed and we cried and I walked out of there so full. I, I had no idea I was so empty and so broken until they filled me. And from that on, I went every week for, you know, two hours. And, and I, I realized that I could be a better person and I could care for my mom better. And everyone else that I touched, touched in my life if I took care of myself. And I think so often we don't, we don't realize the importance of that. And, um, you know, so often our caregivers end up getting sick or even passing away because they don't take care of themselves. And that's the last thing that they want. So really, really critical, critical stuff. Um, well, and you know, Anatole also wrote in the book, he wrote the, there is a, a, um, a little writing called permission where he gives people permission to get upset, to get, you know, to get help, to add services. And then there's another one that says you're pretty tough, but it also emphasizes you cannot do it alone. Exactly. Um, Anatole, I'm just going to um, wrap up here, but I, I want to, uh, and I'll throw this to you, Linda, but I, I'll have Anatole start this one. Um, have you seen any changes in trends in terms of dementia care that you'd like to talk about? Hmm. Well, actually, Linda's a little better to discuss this than I am because she's a little closer to, the, to what's going on. But I think these these uh, cafes, these memory cafes, and as Linda was was just telling me the other day, the the trend today seems to be partly because people are being diagnosed earlier that they're being allowed to um, participate more in the planning uh, of their care and of the rest of their life, and I think that's. That's probably the most major change. Uh, Linda, would you care to elaborate on that, perhaps? Well, yeah, I, and I think I've seen it now. I've been working with the early stage individuals for the last three years um, as more a part of my job. And our group here has developed what they call the Purple Canoe Club. And it emphasizes the fact um, the gentleman who thought about the name, uh, Purple being the color, you know, for um, the Alzheimer's Association, and also 
the canoe. He was speaking of the um, the canoes of the of the French Canadians and the voyageurs. And you cannot pedal that canoe by yourself. And what these individuals do, they go to memory cafes. We have Spark programs, which is a program to museums and art institutes, and um, that allows for the individual with dementia and their care partner to go to social gatherings. And there, are, there's art programs for the person with dementia. And during that time, the care partners sit together and talk and share. And they really have developed a relationship. They may see each other four to six times a week. And it used to be that individuals would not be going out. That's one of the reasons that group did so well, because they had on a Friday afternoon, the group I was talking about earlier, at 3.30. So they looked forward to Friday night, whereas many people didn't look forward to the weekend. With these individuals now in this new group that have worked together as partners, and the persons with dementia have developed friendships, the care partners have developed friendships, they have such strength. One gentleman came and said recently, you know what, I would quit taking all the medicine that I take as long as I have my friends. Because when they go to a brain health program, when they go to an art program, the person with dementia can go with their friend. They don't have to do things alone. And that's what I see as, as changing, which is absolutely phenomenal. We are learning so much from individuals early on that tell us what they need and tell us how hard it is. And it was one of the people, um, a person with dementia, who said to her husband, yeah, you have support groups. What do I have? And so he sought out our early stage support groups. He's the one that helped develop the first members cafe in this area because he wanted programs for he and his wife like that were in other parts of the country, as you well know, and that's something that you have worked a lot with, I know, Lori. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you both for taking the time to be with us today. Linda, is there contact information you would like to give out to our audience? Sure. Um, anyone who has any questions or needs information, I will give you my, my current uh, email address here, which is lmarket, M-A-R-K-U-T, at alz.org. Um, the phone number here is 414-479-8800. I also have my cell phone number, um, which is, because I do do some consulting on the side, which is 608-931-5651. Wonderful. And Anatole, how about you? Is there any contact information you would like to give our listeners? Sure. My uh, email address is A C R A N E A Crane nineteen thirty three at Comcast dot net. Uh, and folks are more than welcome to call me if they like on my home phone at eight four seven six three nine three one four zero. Be happy to talk to anybody who has any comments or questions that I can help with. Okay. Well, thank you both for being with us today. And if people are interested in getting the book, Dementia Caregiving Share Their, or Caregivers Share Their Stories, a support group in a book, you can find that on Amazon. And we definitely can. I'm and sorry. again, um, thank you both so much for being with us today. Um, if any of you didn't get a chance to listen to our last radio show, that was um, with Anthony Cillarello, and we talked about the aging experience with dementia. Our show next week is going to be with Beth Patterson, and she's going to tell us a little bit about her new TV show, Savvy Senior Sor uh, Sources, Talking with the Experts. Um, and then this morning we did our Dementia Chats webinar where uh, we speak with those that have dementia. And we talked a little bit about the new film that we're launching, His Neighbor Phil, which is a Hollywood film that is absolutely exceptional. And uh, we also talked about communication, the need for people with dementia to be, um, to be who they are today and, and for us to have to give them space um, to be able to be who they are and accept who they are today. So really an interesting conversation. I'll be posting that to the blog later tonight. If you're on Facebook, it's on all the pages already. 
Um, the blog itself has a couple of things that you might be interested in. Uh, one is a video on young, a young onset, uh, set to a beautiful song and stories, um, that will, you know, get your tissues. It's a, it's a really, really powerful. And there's a couple of, um, articles regarding his neighbor, Phil, the launch, there's going to be an autograph signing at the Minnesota state fair on, um, August 30th. And that's from 10 to noon. And that'll be at the health, um, health star home health booth in the care 11 building. They're also going to be doing memory screenings there and, um, have lots of different resources uh, for you to be able to check on. That's just, uh, the care 11 buildings right off of Dan patch and, uh, Cooper. I'll also be out there with Alzheimer speaks radio on Thursday from 12 to two. So come on out. We would love just love, love, love to talk to you and um, listen in to the Twin Cities Hit Show tomorrow at 9.30 with Rusty Gatenby. Uh, I'll be talking with him as well then. Have a great week and we'll talk to you all soon. Bye.